Hey everybody, how's it going? This is again Jan and Alex, and we wanted to talk a little bit today. Now, last week we talked about the 1911. This week we're talking about the Browning High Power, and not just the Browning High Power. There's some different ones we have here, and some that are a little bit rare and unique. So, Jan, take it. We'll see what we can find out. If you guys have any questions, don't ever hesitate to go ahead and comment on here, and we will try to answer those as fast as we can. Okay, well, the Browning High Power is probably the most, uh, shall we say, used uh, military pistol. More than 70 countries and police forces, country police forces, use Browning High Powers. They were made in all kinds of different places. Some of them were licensed by Admin, some of them weren't. The interesting thing is that Browning marketed the high power to come out in 1935. It's the last John Browning design pistol. Now, IFM sold a slew of Browning pistols. So, let's tell everybody who John Browning is if they don't already know. John Browning was probably the most prolific. Designed more firearms than anybody else. He designed most of the Winchester lever actions, the 97 Winchesters, most of the Colt pistols, the 1911 pistols. He just designed uh, all the machine guns the U.S. used from World War One to Korea was John Browning designs. Uh, Anything that you've seen that is, is unique and cool, John, John Browning, Browning probably, probably had, had a hand his in it. In. Yeah, <laughs> hand in it somewhere. So now they're they're saying that the high power, that which is what we have here, is the last. They they say is the last John Browning design. That's not entirely true. Um, as we go into this, John Browning build a prototype to come out with it. Well, FN sold a whole slew of Browning design handguns. He had the 1900 FN, 1903 FN, which is the same as the 1903 Colt, uh, the 1910 FN, the 1922 FN, and he was designed a 9mm pistol, but it never got beyond the prototype stage. Uh, and he died unfortunately before he got past the prototype. Right, but did they did they ever? I don't get too much off topic. Did they ever look into that more and try to release what the prototype was? Uh, I've seen pictures of the prototype. What happened is it was the liaison between John Browning and FN was a guy named Sabal. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, he finished the design on the high power and. I think Browning died in 1926, so it was several years. And we'll go into there on Browning's original design. I'm going to pull one of these apart. So if anyone's never seen a high power, this, this is a high power behind us. Right behind us, you guys can see that. He'll be holding one up. Um, it's, it's a design that you've definitely seen. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a, a, the atypical Browning high power. But to show you what the, the developments that John Browning had in his prototype, I'm going to pull this gun apart. It's easier to show you when this is way. And the field strip one, you pull the slide back, put the safety on. This is your safety up to this notch. You lift up, push out the slide stop, which is this. Drop the safety, pull up, slide. All right, so it's, I know it's hard for you guys to see because he did it towards us, but it's a lot like if you've ever seen someone take apart a 1911. Okay. It's almost identical to that. Yeah, now this is the difference between the high power and the 1911. We maintain the locking lugs on the top of the barrel, and the cutouts in the slide, the locking lugs the same. But instead of having the swinging link to pivot the barrel down out of battery, he cut a cam in the bottom in here, and he also made an integral feed ramp on it, which helped the reliability. And he done away with the barrel bushing and made the gun easier and simpler to manufacture, and supposedly it made it more accurate. So, if a lot of people know what we're talking about, go back and watch last week's video, and you'll kind of see us talking about some of these things on the 1911. Which is, if you've ever taken apart a 1911, there's a little swivel piece down here at the bottom. It's called a swinging leg. All right, and it is what it, your barrel up. Yeah. All right, up and down, and this now, cam does the same thing right here. Okay. Now, every almost every modern firearm today uses this same system. Uh, the Glocks do, Sigs do, the Smith and Wesson Shields do. They all use this cam. Now, 
sometimes is totally enclosed in a kidney shaped hole in the bottom. Mm -hmm. But this is, was developed and the high power come out with it first. So when did they first come out with a high power? The high power itself came out in 1935. So in 1935, even today, they're using the same features and let's say technology today that they, that they were using on a high power in the 30s. Yeah, then we'll get to this. Uh, Stabaugh, Browning never thought that you could make a double stack handgun magazine that would functional. Uh, the high power is the first handgun to have a double column feed or a double column single feed magazine. Uh, this came out in 1934. Five, you could say this was the first handgun with a high capacity magazine. Uh, that's where the word high power comes from. Not from the cartridge itself, it's just 9mm Luger or 9mm. Mm -hmm. But these sell 13 rounds. And in the, sure, in the 30s, holding 13 rounds, rounds was huge. It was a huge amount. Which, of, on an average 1911, you're looking at eight, eight rounds, seven eight, rounds eight. in that area. You know, you're, you're almost doubling your capacity. Yeah, and that was a big deal in 1935. Now, uh, go into that's kind of the history of it. Uh, actually, Sabal was a great firearms designer. We may talk about some of his other things at another day. Uh, people like to say, uh, he worked with Browning until he died. And like I say, he became the head of research and development for our team. So, anyway. let, so let's talk about what we have here in front of us, Francis. Okay. What, what would an original high-powered look like? And in, 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 let's start there. This is what an original high power would look like. Uh, this is actually a really, really early post-World War II gun. But the originals would look like this. Now they could have had this style sight, the fixed sight, or they could have had a tangent sight. This is what they call a tangent sight. Oh, uh, okay, I've never seen that sight. Yeah, this is what they call a tangent sight, if you see. So this is what you'd see on like a, a, a Mauser. Or, uh, and, or, or most rifles. Yeah, it was similar to what you would see on the rifles of the air, but they called this a tangent type. Uh, the original FN guns would have had a shoulder stock like this one. I'll go into this one in a minute. But it would not have been a stock holster. It would have just been a board. But it would have attached the same way. So if I was looking at this one, for instance, I'm going to look at this and say it's, a, it's an original high power. But what I don't see on here is the word browning or uh, or anything along those lines we'll why is get, that we'll get into that a little okay. later we get to another model we'll okay. get into that all right so, so I, i've seen the early book. guns were made by fn right and, and if anybody doesn't know fn that's the same people that you'll see nowadays with modern stuff like the the 509 the 57 the scar 16 the scar 17 the 249 uh, they are the largest manufacturer of military rifles so and they also a lot of people don't understand fn owns other companies yes. okay so fn owns browning fn owns uh, winchester. winchester all those people are in one company and nobody really knows fn but they are by far the largest manufacturer of military weapons in the entire world they they were a large manufacturer of military weapons in the 30s and the 40s and so on uh, and we get into a little history when the nazis invaded uh, belgium and france in 1940 most of the management of FN fled. They would not work for the Nazis, so they left. But the Nazis brought in their own people, and they run the FN factory. For one, FN made a lot of 98 Mausers, but they also made high powers. And the Nazis went ahead and had uh, the company, the company, you know, Gunner and the rest, make high powers. And they were probably between three or 400,000 Browning high powers made for the uh, German military. Now, during World War, War II, II Okay, so and in World War II, if you found a World War II it would have high a, power, it would have a whopping ant well. But it, it would not necessarily be rare. No, they're relatively rare in this country. They a lot of them were destroyed, and the only ones in this country were the ones that best brought back. That they brought back. So, so it, if you see one in the U.S., more than likely it's a it's a bring back. It's a probably a bring back, and that's like a pre-war branding high power. They're extremely rare too, because they only made about forty-five thousand. Because there's a middle of the depression, sales weren't that good. They really didn't take off like World War II. What, why do people want high powers? Uh, if you ever shop one, you'd love them. Uh, and he, he, you, you hear it all the time, man. I, I still love my high power. 
Why, in your opinion, would somebody want a high power over any other gun of the air, like a, a 1911 or anything else? Why, why is it so, you know, why is it so popular? Uh, they were very simple. They're very lot reliable. As you've seen, how simple it was for me to field strip this. If you've ever field strip a 1911, the difference between day and night. The accuracy is quite good. They're very, very reliable. I just have to like them. Yeah. You're not the only one. There's, there's tons of people that like them, but let's. The we, problem is, is they've never sold. They've always been an expensive gun. Mm -hmm. They're an expensive gun to manufacture. And the fit in the finish of the brown has always been really quite good. So now, this, this is a military one, and if you see the finishes in there, and this is really a military mm -hmm. one. And we'll talk about this one next. Sure. Just, so we well let's do that because we talked about the earliest one. This is this is the early one. Yeah. Now why would I have had this? What what is the purpose of this? Why would I have ever seen this? Okay. This is what they call an English high power. English. English. John English. It's a Canadian company. During World War II. I don't know where the Canadian government or the British government, they contracted them to make Browning high powers and they took an original high power and reverse engineered it and they come up with the English high power. They only made them during World War II. This is actually... Why a, would Canadians... Well, they couldn't get high powers from Belgium, the Nazis. Well, what were they were going to give them to the Canadians? Right, or the British. And they, you know, and they were a popular gun and the British wanted them. And they were a good gun. <clears throat> so they made them in there and the the Canadian and the British guns would have had sights like this one, would have had a fixed sight like this one, as you can see. The this is what they called a Chinese contract. So I I'll, I'll just tell you this looking at these side by side right now. What you're going what he's talking about on the front of your site. Maison though, maybe we can take this one in. And so everybody really understands these this one is completely fixed. <coughs> they are built in. I mean, there is no moving this stuff. It is built in. I'm sure it's pressed in. Um, but then on this, you can see there's a groove, just like you would see nowadays on a Glock or a Smith or whatever, um, a, a newer 9K11. Now, back here is more white, like you'd see on even a rifle of the, of the time period. And you call that a... It's called a tangent side, and if you can look the markings on it. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's in meters or yards. I assume it's in uh, yards, means it's Canadian. Uh, the guns, magazines will interchange between the two. Uh, most of the parts won't because these are on an English pattern and of course the high tires on a metric pattern. But as I was getting into, this is a Chinese contract. The Chinese, for some reason, like hand guns with detachable shoulder stocks. And the shoulder stock is kind of a copy of the shoulder stock off the room handle Mauser. The stock itself. Why? It just doesn't make sense. What way? This had to be something that would have been lost. No, not necessarily. What would you have done with this? Where would you have put this? You know? Well, what you've done is, I went through this with a room handle Mauser a while back. This attaches to your pistol belt. Oh, you used it as a holster. This is your holster. And then you can do a quick detach off your holster as such. There. And then if you wanted a carbine, What's the advantage? What what is the advantage of using this carbine? Is well, it's something? more accurate. It's easier to shoot. It's you know you get better accuracy. You got more contact points. Okay. Uh, nobody else really used it very much. Uh, this was a Chinese thing. The Chinese like handguns with shoulder. Would the Germans ever had this? Uh, the Germans had it on broom handle Mausers. They also had it on artillery Lugers, Navy Lugers too. But they would have never done it to a high power. No. Yeah. That, 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 that's my question. No, I don't, there was no reason for them to do it because this is something that would have been. Now the Chinese Belgians thing. made a few high powers with tangent sides and, de and detachable mm -hmm. stocks, but are, those would be the holy grail to a Browning high power. Player. Understood. Understood. So anyway, so this, but this is a, like I say, uh, an English high power. It's Canadian, and I'll put this back in this one back together. So if you guys want to see what it looks like getting back together, basically, if you want to come in. 
we will show them how this actually gets put back together. As long as you're on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, if anybody's wondering what this other camera is, this is YouTube, this is Facebook. If you guys want to see any of the close-ups, just hop on to Facebook and we'll get you taken care of. You put the uh, recoil spring and the spring in there. You put it back on the slot. Slide on the frame. Put all the way back. Engage the safety. Which, the safety's right back here. That well, slides into the slot right up there. And you put the slide stop back in. The hole there. Okay, that's a lot easier than the 1911. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, and now uh, high powers do have a magazine safety, so I'm gonna <coughs> pull it open, leave it open. Now uh, we'll get into there in the early 1950s. Browning redesigned the high power. Well, not Browning, I shouldn't say Browning. FN. And if we look in here, this is an early one. And if we look here, and we look here, here's the extractor. You did not see the extractor on this. We'll bring it up here so they can see. All right, extractor right here. This is this is the newer one. The newer the version. These come out in the early 50s. The first ones had an extractor like a 1911. It's an internal extractor. Uh, the firing pin retainer holds the extractor in, and it's internal. F pin modified it to an external extractor. It's probably a little cheaper to manufacture, and it's actually better. Better. Okay, it's I was going to ask you if you thought it was a good uh, yeah. design change or not. Yeah, and now this particular gun here is a Browning. This one says Browning on it. Uh, this gun, this gun, and this one. And this one, they say, uh, well, this one doesn't say, this says English. But this, this gun here is FN mark. This is Browning. Browning did not import high powers into the U.S. until the mid 50s. So if you see a Browning that says, or excuse me, a high power that says Browning, you know it's at least in the mid 50s. Yeah, that would be as a old start as, in yeah. the mid 50s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this particular one was probably made in the early 60s. Uh, they made these guns. Browning made them with all kinds of different sights. Uh, different hammer fit configurations. Some of them had a round hammer, some of them had a spur hammer like this one. Uh, some of them had a tangent sight, some of them had adjustable sights, but the guns themselves that uh, uh, Browning imported are basically all the same, except the very <coughs> last ones. Uh, they put an Ambrose Dexter safety on them, and they made a few in 40 Smith & Wesson. Now, I've seen one in 40. I've, I've actually had those in the shop before. Now, if you're a high-powered buyer, what should you be aware of? If you were on the market to buy a high power, what is the top of the line high power and what is one that you probably don't want to mess with? I'll put it to you this way. I wouldn't be afraid to give it. It's more what your preference is. The ones with the rounded hammer, they look neat, but they're a little worse about hammer bite. The ones with the spur hammer, which like this one has. Yeah, fat hands. It's not as bad on biting your hand. It's either. a little bit more of a gap. Yeah, it's not quite as bad. But anyway, uh, so I, I guess if, if, for instance, this one right here, this is not a Browning high power. It is a it's a high high power, power but it is not a Browning or FN high power. What is it? Okay, this is a Hungarian copy. Uh, There's several countries in the world that copied high powers. Uh, some of them were under license from FN. FN gave them a license and the expertise. Some of them reverse engineered and were not built with Browning's blessing, and this is one of them. This is an FEG, made in Hungary. Uh, they're actually a good gun. There's nothing wrong with them, but they don't say <clears throat> FN on them, and they'll work about half the money. But that's what. That's why I was asking earlier, because, for instance, if I sold this, and it, it's an FEG, it probably shoots just as well. It does take the same magazines? Same magazines. Magazines so, will interchange. All right. I don't think the parts will, but the magazines. <clears throat> so it's the same magazine. Sorry, we got a cold. Um, Magazines will interchange. And if you look at a Browning and FEG, they look almost, almost identical. identical. Right? Um, <laughs> but if I was to, I was a buyer, all right, would I be better to save my money and buy a Browning? I would buy the Browning. For one of the Brownings, they quit making, uh, FN quit making high powers about two or three years ago. Yes, they're and, very hard to get a hold of. They, like, and we the price of them has probably went up 40, Way 50 up. percent since they quit making them. Yep. So, uh, they make great shooters, they're great home protection guns. As a matter of fact, it's not one of these, but 
I kept one of these in my bedroom for self-defense up till last week. See, I mean, so, but we let's go back a little bit farther to you now. You said that they they done these in forty. Did they do them in any other calibers? No, nine millimeter and forty. Forty Smith and Wesson is the only calibers they ever made. Them. And then they've also done these in different frames. The and what I mean by that is because the weights. So, for instance, oh, you yeah. have you have steel. But then you also have something like what you brought here, which would be aluminum. Yeah, now this is a, not a U.S. import high power. Uh, this is a Belgium gun. These were never imported into the United States. This is an aluminum frame high power. Uh, they're very rare in this country. Uh, Why are they rare? Because Browning never imported them. They come in by other means. Uh, I'm not sure how they all got here. I mean, you know, I think some of the soldiers overseas might have bought them and brought them home. They could. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly where they all come from, but they're quite rare in this country. But uh, aluminum frame, if you can't do it here, but if you hold it two side to side, uh, the weight yeah, it's, it's much different. So, And if you look at this, this is a military gun. It's an FN built military gun. And if you look at the difference in the finish between the military and the commercial, uh, you know, the fit and the, the polish and everything. Well, the same one. This is a military gun, and this is, you know, commercial. And as you can see, they're not as high polished, and they're not as pretty. But. So, let's recap this, all right? If I was to go out, and I'm thinking myself as a buyer, if you have an opportunity to buy a high power, buy one. Yeah. They're, they're really shrinking up on the market. Number two, what should you expect to buy, what price on a mid-grade high power, what would you expect to pay for it? I'd say you won't touch a high power anymore for less than that. Okay. So there's copies out there. I'm sure you're going to buy for a lot less, but an actual nice shaped Browning high power. Whether it says FN on it, if it says Fabergé National or Browning on it, they're the same gun. Actually, the ones that doesn't say Browning on it are worth more than the ones that do. Really? Uh, they're rare. Because they're, the, they're older. They're older because and they're rare. Because <coughs> if they see browning on it, you know it's at least 50. But still, that's you know nothing. Yeah. As far as reliability, like I said, I kept one of these at home in my bedroom for self defense. And high powers has always been expensive. No this for a fact. My wife bought it for me for Christmas the first year we were married in 1974, and she gave $300 for it. Whoa. That's what they cost in 1970. That, that would have been expensive, for sure. They were expensive. They've always been expensive. They're a very reliable gun. The one I have my own personal gun. I shot bowling bins with it for a while. Uh, but anyway, uh, I probably got 14, 15 thousand. And what have you serviced on? Uh, I broke a fire and pin retainer in it, and you can count the number of times it's malfunctioned on one hand. That's awesome. And so, uh, that was ammunition not the gun. So before I have Jan do a closing, guys, if you have any questions, this is the time to ask on the Browning High Power in general. Um, if you've ever wanted uh, to ask us a question, let us know right now. In, in closing, Jan, what, what would you like to say about what we have in front of us and the Browning High Power in general? Uh, in this country, uh, you know, there are nine millimeter when the high powers were sold a lot. Everybody wanted a 1911, they wanted a 45, nine millimeters had a bad rep in the 70s. They got to the 80s and then we got the polymer frame guns. I think the last commercial high powers, they sold for eight or nine hundred dollars and you could buy a Glock for four or five hundred. Yep. And so, you know, they didn't sell. And FN's tooling more out, they didn't sell anymore. They had more modern guns, so they quit making them. I always wondered why they quit doing it. I really do. I think it was like, was it just a timing thing? It's like, why, like why, are we, why, why are we in the they, business to exactly, make money? Exactly. Why are we focusing on a product that's so hard to build that we can't produce that many of when we have people dying to get certain guns? Yeah. So, yeah, and they sell military. <laughs> and most militaries, I'm sure there's bounty high powers in militaries all over the world mm -hmm. still in use. You know, I know those things. Sure. You know. But not so much in this country. It's like, well, one of your employees is a 1911 fan, and we were talking, and I told him, well, the high power is a lot better designed gun than a 1911. And we gradually said, well, yeah, maybe, but it's the wrong caliber. So there you go. So, guys, hopefully next week we will bring something else to you guys to be able to 
kind of talk about. If you have anything you want to see, anything in history that you guys want to focus on or have questions over, always want to know, maybe that we can answer for you, don't ever hesitate to comment down below. Send us a message, call the shop, see if we'll be able to do that for you. If you guys have anything cool that you want to bring in and show us, We'd be more than happy to take a look at that for you also. So guys, thanks again for watching. Um, if there's anything you guys want to know, please let us know.